Our scripture reading comes from Matthew 10, 40 through 42, and is found printed in your bulletin. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person, person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these things will lose their reward. This is the word of God for the people of God. I have to tell you, um, one of the blessings of being here is to sing a hymn out of the United Methodist. For nine years, um, uh, the, uh, the church I served in, in Bowling Green and Trinity came out of the uh, Evangelical United Brethren tradition, and uh, they never bought into the Methodist side of the merger. <laughs> so I've been working with this antiquated hymnal uh, that really is more Baptist-oriented than United Methodist-oriented, and I used to whine about it all the time, and they'd say, tough. <laughs> I checked on the night I came here for the introduction uh, was I walked in here and I checked to make sure uh, you had it. Uh, and I didn't do that nine years ago in Trinity when I went to the introduction. I just assumed a church of that size and um, influence in our, our conference would have had the United Methodist Temple. And uh, after the introduction and I signed the paperwork, I walked out into the sanctuary and I said, oh my land, what is that? <laughs> and, 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 and the tradition of that hymnal did not have a Latin section. Uh, it just didn't do the church year. And I'm really into the church year. I love the seasons. And uh, so I had to start um, reprinting hymns from our hymnal, which meant we had to pay lots and lots of royalty permissions to do that. And um, my treasurer used to call me up and say, uh, do we have to do this? And I said, yeah, get a new hymnal. And uh, that, that, I, I, that was one of the battles I never, ever, ever won. So I'm sitting here singing what uh, I love hymn 122. Um, I just, I just love it because it's, it, it, it's odd and peculiar and it sort of captures that sense of mystery about everything and it asks all these questions. Um, and all of a sudden I realize I'm home. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Um, that's very uh, well nicely read gospel lesson. Jesus certainly tells us something we all know, that if we welcome people in his name, or if we okay, if we don't welcome people in his name, well, we're sort of on our own. And uh, this is sort of the day of welcome. I and mean, you're welcoming me into your family, and Susie and I are welcoming you into mine, ours, and uh, uh, we have this little dance we have to do during this process of welcoming. We have to uh, learn how to uh, read each other, and we have all these questions like, um, you know, are we going to get along, are we going to, how are we going to, are we going to agree or disagree, how are we going to handle conflict, all that stuff, you know, at least that's sort of there, and, and uh, at the end of the day, do we really belong to each other, and um, if the temple's any indication. <laughs> Good. Good. Um, when I went to 
Trinity, uh, I would talk and someone would come up to me afterwards and they would say, yeah, you know, you said something that I thought was so funny, but I know I shouldn't laugh in church. <laughs> and I said, oh, my. You do laugh in church. Well, that's not the way we do it here. Well, they were laughing by the time I left, maybe more at me than with me. But, <laughs> but, but um, um, you don't seem up to and I think that's a good thing to go on to school. Well, anyways, when we welcome people in the name of Christ, the question is, how do we do that? What does that mean? And one of the challenges we have in the church today is that we live in a time in which there's a lot of division in the church. And there are all these controversial issues that are floating around in our society. And we're trying to make sense of all those issues, and um, they cause conflicts in the life of our faith community. And um, I really think that uh, one of the, at the heart of a lot of these conflicts is um, we struggle with the conflicting vision on what the church should be about. And uh, if we get a little frustrated about that, we should take some comfort in the fact that it has always been that way. There's always been this, these two conflicting visions of how the church ought to be, how the religious community ought to be, how the people of faith ought to be. And uh, it's biblical. And I've been playing a lot lately with the exile that takes place in the Old Testament, about 700 years before the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, the Hebrew people and Judah got a little cocky, a little arrogant. They believed God was on their side, and in many ways God was on their side, but they sort of misinterpreted that to I think that meant that they could sort of do whatever they want. And they picked a fight with the Babylonians. And you know what? The Babylonians really came down on them like a ton of bricks. And when the Babylonians won the war, uh, they came in and they tore down the temple. And they disassembled the, the government. And then they did the worst thing you could have possibly imagined. They looked at the population of Judah, and then they went out and they picked the best and the brightest. They picked the smartest and the prettiest. They picked the youngest and the strongest. They took all of those people, and they drug them back. with the idea that these people will help them enrich the Babylonian culture. And we had that wonderful psalm, Psalm 137, where, they, where they, these people are crying out, how do we sing songs of Zion by the rivers of Babylon? How do we sing praises to God when our hearts are broken? The other thing that the Babylonian it is they left behind the old, the sick, the ugly, the tall, the undesirables. And in Hebrew theology, we call those people a remnant. And sometimes we even call them the righteous remnant because as they were left behind, in what was once Judah, they kept the home fires burning. They practiced their faith. They did the best they could to order their lives around the teachings of the Torah. And they held it together. And they held it together for three and a half generations, 70 years. 
And then Babylon got cocky. And it got arrogant. And it decided to pick a fight with the Persians. And Cyrus, the king of Persia, had read about Yahweh and found the whole story of the Hebrew people fascinating. And so when Cyrus beat the daylights out of the Babylonians and took over Babylon, one of the first things he did is he issued a decree and he told the Hebrew people they could go home. And he told the Hebrew people when they went home, they could rebuild their temple and reorder their government. And they can provide for their people a way of living that will be faithful to their God, Yahweh. What a glorious day. So these people begin to trickle back from Babylon. And all of a sudden, the remnant, the righteous remnant, is having to deal with these people who are the descendants of those who were thrown into exile and back home. And this creates the crisis. And the crisis is, well, do we really want these people back? Well, maybe we do, because they are our people. Do we want them all back? And all of a sudden, two different schools of thought emerge. Two different visions for what this new Hebrew nation emerge. One emerges around the prophet Ezekiel. You know, he's the, he's the dead, bum, dead bums guy in the, in the Old Testament. <laughs> and uh, this vision operated like this. God demands righteousness. So we will only accept those who can demonstrate to us they remain righteous in that law. And then he defined what righteousness was. You could not marry a Babylonian spouse. You could not buy land in Babylon. And you got to remember, it's 70 years, so you got generations going, and people are settling in. You could not work for any cause or, or any kind of a business that would support Babylon. You have to demonstrate that you are faithful to the teachings of the Torah. And so as people returned, they were sort of, the Ezekiel people wanted this litmus test. Are you righteous? We only want the righteous. And then the other group is the community that formed around the teachings of the prophet Isaiah. They had an entirely different vision for this new star. And this vision went like this. God is about reconciliation. God is about healing. Yahweh is about doing what you can to make your family whole. And so they argue that Anyone and everyone who wants to come home should be able to come home. Anyone and everyone who wants to reconnect with the Hebrew faith to make a home with the Hebrew people are invited. And they have a wonderful chapter in the uh, 55th chapter of Isaiah, where it says, you know, you want to eat, you want to drink, don't have any money, come anyways. Come anyways. It doesn't make any difference. We want you home. We want you home. We want you home. And from that 
going on from the history of our biblical literature and through the history of our faith communities, there's been a struggle between those two visions. Do we expect righteousness? Or do we live in a community that wants to make the family whole? In American Protestantism, um, in the society we live in today, are those two visions that strain and creating challenges for the life? Um, the interesting thing about those two visions is that they've lived concurrently in the faith community. And congregations throughout uh, the history of the church have sort of fallen in one or the other. Some congregations demand righteousness and expect some kind of legal listening. To a set of principles and teachings. And others see their work as the work of reconciliation, of making the family. torturous way I have shared with you two conflicting visions. Both have been biblical truths. Both will follow us into our current age. I've made my home with the Isaiah people. Um, I think the work of the church is about making the family. Righteousness makes me a little nervous. If I expect righteousness out of you, then you have a right to expect righteousness out of me. And, uh, you know, I'm a surly kind of guy. That's my wife. <laughs> so, I like my, my older dachshund. We have two dachshunds, and dachshunds are usually surly. The younger one is the dumb one. She's the sweetest dog in the world. But the older one is really smart, but she's surly. And, and, and Brenna sort of is like me, you know. And, 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 and it's hard to be righteous when you get surly from time to time. Um, and the other thing is, it's hard to be righteous when you're broke. It's hard to be righteous when you're broke. And uh, my God, like, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the world today that can break us. Um, that's why I like the 13th Psalm and use that this morning. Um, here's a psalmist who acknowledges he's broken. And uh, I gotta believe some of you are broken. Because this is the way it is in life. <clears throat> so I was raised in a church that practiced the vision that Isaiah taught. Come on. Be part of the family. Our mission is to make the family whole. The last nine years, I was appointed to a church whose vision was in the righteousness camp. The first week I was in my office, one of the church leaders wandered into my office and told me that we had a problem. And the problem was this, that there were people leaving the church because they discovered that some of our members believed in evolution. And that she wanted me in no uncertain terms, and she had names. It was almost like Joseph McCarthy. I got names. These <laughs> <laughs> people don't believe the right thing. I got names. Uh, she wanted me to go 
don't purge them. <laughs> and I'm sitting here going, oh my, Dorothy, you're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs>
And you know when you sing in the church and the organ is playing, you know what you're doing. No matter how thick the walls are, the music bleeds through the building onto the streets. And she hears bleeding through the walls, the choir, and the work. Doing the end. And she said it sounded sweet. She entered the building. There were about 30 very old people. <laughs> worshiping in that space. And a handful of people in the choir singing the hymn. She says, when she walked into the sanctuary, gosh, it smells like healing in this place. It smells like healing in this place. So she went back the next Sunday. Sunday after that. And these 30 old people, she says, 30 old people adopted her. And made her family. And then she discovered that the guy who ran off and dumped her left her pregnant. And she got fearful. Oh no, I'm just starting this new experience in this community. How are they going to understand me? How are they going to accept me? And so in the Sunday school class, she finally got up enough nerve and she said, I got something to tell you. Sunday school class had this cane she was holding on to. And she said, this teacher took that cane and she raised it up and hit the floor with it and made a big now noise. And she said, this teacher said, good God people, we got work to do. God's giving us new life. <laughs> I want this place to smell like healing. That's what I'm going to work for. Every day I come to work. I want us to make our family whole. And if we break a few rules in the process, and if we're not so legalistic about it, so be it. Know that you are loved in the name of the 